Okay, without further ado, we're going to have the message of the hour that is going to be uh, brought to us by Hilda Tim, entitled Satan's Prison Center. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are we doing today? Good. 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 Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. It's a pleasure to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. It's a pleasure to do the service of the Lord. Amen. And whatever capacity he calls us to do that in, is that correct? Amen. Amen. So I'm just going to have one more brief word of prayer. As my custom is before we begin. Okay. And then we'll begin with our lesson for today. Dear Father God, again, we just want to touch and agree with everything that's been said and done here this morning, Lord. As we hear talks of Bible studies going forth, Lord, we know that there's a time that your people uh, need to have that experience where they seek after your face, Lord, while you yet may be found, Lord. We're praying that this is a special season where the saints would hide your word in their heart, Lord, that they may not sin against thee, Lord. We know the enemy likes to come in like a flood and will present things as overwhelming to us. But just as Jesus gained that victory in the wilderness over Jesus by the word of God, we know that same means of strength and support is provided to us, Lord. We know that you have commanded the angels that excel in strength to be with us, Lord, as we go through all of the coming walks of life, Father. Lord, we're asking that as we dive into this subject, Satan's thousand-year prison sentence, that you would help us to see the workings of your marvelous plan in action, Lord, that you would even paint the picture in a brighter hue, Lord, that we may understand even the most minute detail and the glory that you have instilled in your written word, Lord, may be impressed upon our heart this morning, we pray in the beautiful and worthy name of Christ Jesus, both my Lord and my Savior. Amen. So as we begin our study today, uh, the basis is Revelation chapter 20, 1 through 3, and also Revelation 21, verses 1 through 8. We're going to primarily place our attention in chapter 20, but we're going to use all the Bible. How much of the Bible are we going to use? All the Bible. The Bible is how many books? <coughs> the Bible is one book with 66 parts. So we believe that all the Bible can be used. We believe that every, every scripture has to have its bearing upon the plan of salvation. There is no use of scripture in the Bible if you believe that. So I like to hear those pages ruffling. Uh, or those iPhones ruffling, whatever you're using to get there, we want you to get there because we've got to have our sword, we've got to have the full armor of God on if we're going to be victorious in this time where Satan is tempting to steal me a soul. What do you say? Amen. All right. So let me ask you a question as we begin today. What's the longest prison sentence that you have heard someone give? Right. That, that's long. Mm -hmm. I want to share with you some of the things I found. So an Oklahoma child rapist, his name was Charles Scott Robinson, was sentenced to 30,000 years in prison. 5,000 years for each, uh, each case or count of brought against him. Now, the judge, Ms. Lo judge Owens, said I wanted to make sure that he didn't get off on some technicality, so he gave him 30,000 years. <laughs> Uh, it gets, it gets wor uh, get worse. Let me show you this one. So, Otman L. Nave was given a 42,924-year prison sentence by a Spanish court for his part in the 2004 Madrid uh, train bombing. So, good luck serving that out. However, uh, in Spain, you're going to limit it to how much time you can actually spend in jail. So, he'll serve about 40 years. And this one. This is the one, uh, the longest one I found. It was a, a, a lady, actually. Her name was Chamoy Thip Yeso of Thailand, who was sentenced to 141,078 years for being involved in a pyramid scheme that defrauded 16,231 people out of a total of about 2 million. Now, this included some of the members of the royal Thailand family. So, of course, you know she was going down, but there are limits on how long you can serve in Thailand, just like Spain, for Fraulein, so she'll serve about 20 years. But did you know the Bible tells us that Satan is also going to be given a prison sentence 
and he won't serve part of it. He won't get off on a technicality. He's going to serve the full 1,000 years. What do you say? Amen. Amen. So let's stay. So open your Bibles with me. We want to get a picture of what the earth is going to be like during that 1,000 years because we covered some of the events in the last message or the events that preceded, right? What happens to the wicked living? Go back to heaven. The wicked living? I'm sorry. The wicked living die at the presence of his son. And the wicked dead stay where? Stay in the grave. What happens to the righteous living? Go back to Christ. What happens to the righteous dead? I rise and meet him in the air. Okay. Okay. So we covered some things uh, leading up to the event. So also, uh, we just got to paint the picture a little bit broader up to some of the events that, that kind of lead into the thousand years and the condition of the earth during that 1,000 year period. So Revelation 1 and verse 7 reads this way. It says, Behold, he, who's the he? Jesus, cometh with clouds. And how many eyes? Every, Every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. You know, the, uh, you know there's an expression that is very common in the world today. Have any of you ever heard the young kids say YOLO? No, no hurry? Okay, I'm, okay, I'm still a millennial, so work with you. <laughs> so the expression means you only live once. But this theory is very much false because every human being will live at least how many times? Twice. twice. But not every human being will die twice. So the righteous that die, die how many times? One. The wicked that die, how many times do they die? Twice. 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 The people that pierce Christ, how many times do they die? Three. Three. Three times. They die in their literal lives. They're resurrected, especially to see Christ come in the clouds of glory. They die again. Then at the end of the 1,000 years, they once again must taste death. Okay, so we know that every human being lives at least twice. Minimal. And there's some special cases I can go into, but we'll leave it off for now. Okay, and then uh, we're told that the dead in Christ rise first in 1 Thessalonians. Let's turn over there. We're just building our case from the Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 17, but we'll look at verse 16 and verse 17. Where are we going? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Amen. Verses 15 and 17. Let's do 16 and 17. 16 and 17. 16 and 17. My pages are sticking, so bear with me. Okay. So we're looking at chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. And what can we gain from these scriptures? What can we glean some special truth from? It says, For who? The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with what? A shout. With the voice of the archangel, the chief, the leader of angels. It says, And with the what? Trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall do what? Rise first. Then, and this is what we talked about a moment ago, we that are alive and remain shall be what? Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet who? The Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So how long do the saints spend with the Lord? Okay, that was a test. Sometimes when, I, when we do this study, people say, yeah, a thousand years. They, they spend a thousand years with Jesus, but actually the answer is they spend a, uh, forever with Jesus. They spend a thousand years in heaven with Jesus. Okay, but it also tells us here some of the details about these events. I know I'm covering more than one subject, but I don't know if I'll ever do an independent study on the rapture alone. Uh, it's the, the most of the Protestant world views it. But it tells us here some glorious details about this coming. It says the Lord should descend from heaven with what? What's the first thing? A shout. And what's the next thing it says? With the voice of a archangel. And the third thing is with a trump. Which of those sound like to you it could be a secret? Something that we could miss. Turn on the TV the next day and say, oh man, Jesus came yesterday, I missed it. None of these events sound like anything that could be silent, right? So from the Bible, and you can also read in Isaiah, and also in Ezekiel, it talks about it should be very tempestuous about them. So this won't be an event that we can miss uh, if we, I mean, it's impossible to miss. There's another uh, sign I want to take a look at with you. Turn to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16, because we're building our case to see what's the condition of the world 
for the 1,000 years. Revelation chapter 16, and we're going to place our attentions on verses 18 through 21. Revelation 16, verses 18 through 21. And once you've made it there, let me know by saying amen. 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 Verse 18 reads in this manner. It says, and there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there were, again, doesn't sound very silent, does it? And there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So what's a, what's a big earthquake? What does he go on, on the Richter scale today? If we have a huge earthquake, what do you think? Maybe a five? A seven. Seven. Eight. 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 This will probably be a 15. <laughs> this is going to be off the Richter off the scale. Charts. Yes. This is, it's never been an earthquake like this. You think about the Lisbon, Bond, Lisbon earthquake and so forth. There's never been another earthquake like this in the history of civilization. Okay, and it goes on to say, uh, so great. Jump down to verse 20. Listen to what kind of earthquake this is going to be. It says, and every island did what? Land away. And every mountain, and the mountains were not found. And also, let's look at verse 21 while we're here. Yeah, let's look at verse 21. It says, And there fell upon men a what? Great hail out of heaven. Listen to the size of this hail. Every stone about the weight of a talent. That's amazing to me. Uh, the, the record size for a hailstone that I've heard about was the size of a softball. You know coming down with the speed and velocity that it's coming down with, that'll kill you, right? Mm -hmm. yes. But how big is a talent? That's about 58 pounds. 58 to 100 pounds. That's a huge piece, I mean, yeah. of hell. This is going to be falling on the wicked, but God's people are going to be preserved. Um, it's interesting, when we look at Egypt, we can see an example of what happens in the last time. An uh, interesting thing to study would be to parallel the plagues of Egypt with uh, the, plague, the seven last plagues that are poured out. And what was it that got God's people through the plagues in Egypt? What did they have in their door for? No. They had the blood of who? Jesus. Blood of the Lamb. So if we're going to get through this fierce time, this time of testing, this great tribulation, as it were, what are we going to need? The blood. The blood of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. That's the only way we're going to make it through. There's a psalm in chapter 91 that talks about 10,000 may fall where? 10,000 may fall also, mm -hmm. but it shall not come nigh thy dwelling. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because they have the blood of the Lamb. Okay, I want to move on. Uh, let's look at uh, Jeremiah. So, we see the events that's leading up to this thousand years. What's happening? You're seeing people come out of the grave. You're seeing them go back to heaven. You see a great company that is slain, and we're going to talk about that, by the brightness of the Lord's coming. You see these hailstones, this great earthquake. You see mountains and, 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 and uh, islands being moved out of their place. They're being tossed around as though they were just nothing, right? And so let's look at Jeremiah chapter 4. We're going to read verses 23 through 26. Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 23 through 26. And once you've made it there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Okay, so in Jeremiah 24, verse 23, what does it say there? In verse 23, I'm oh, sorry, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23, says there, I was in Jeremiah 23 looking for verse 20, and then it stops at verse 15, so I would have been left out. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23 through 26, reads this way. It says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was what? Without, Without form. form and void. Hmm. Doesn't that sound familiar? Yes. We're going to get to that, though. I won't, I won't say anything about it at this moment. And the heavens, it says what? And they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they what? Trembled. Trembled. And all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was how many men? Yeah. No man. And all the birds of heaven were fled. So the earth is void. There's no light. The islands and mountains have been moved. There's no human life that can be perceived upon the earth. This sounds like an event that there's going to be uh, 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 some notable changes in this earth's history. Turn over to Isaiah. The Gospel Prophet. Turn to Isaiah chapter 24. Isaiah the 24th chapter. And what important truth can we gain from this chapter? And we just we just give a 360 view, as it were, of what the world will look like during uh, this thousand-year period. 
It's going to be important. Isaiah chapter 24, <laughs> verse 1. Let's start there. And we're going to jump around just a little bit. So chapter 1 of Isaiah 24 says, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth how? Empty. Empty. And maketh it waste. waste. And turneth it upside down. Man. And scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. Jump over to verse 3. It says, The land shall be what? Utterly, utterly empty. empty. The, uh, and utterly spoiled, for the Lord hath spoken this word. We read in Great Controversy, page 657, it says, At the coming of Christ, the wicked are blotted from the face of the whole earth, consumed with the spirit of his mouth, and destroyed by the brightness of his glory. So they are what? They are blotted, they are consumed by the spirit of his mouth, and destroyed by the brightness of his glory. Now we read in verse 20 of the same chapter, Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 19 and 20. Let's jump back up to verse 19. It says, The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean, dissolved. The earth is moved how? Exceedingly. The earth shall reel. What does that mean? It shall reel to and fro. Back and forth. It's being thrown back and forth. We've never seen anything like this before. Like a drunkard. And we've probably all seen a drunkard before. How do they? Stagger. They're moving around. And they don't have any balance, right? So we've all seen it before. The, the earth, the whole world is going to be moved that way, it says. And it shall be removed like a cottage. And the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it. And the, it shall fall and not rise again. Desire of Ages, page 780, says, An earthquake marked the hour when Christ laid down his life. We remember that, right? And another earthquake witnessed the moment that he took it up in triumph. We know the graves were open. And who came up? The saints. The saints, right? It was a special resurrection. I wonder when we see that repeated again. Mm -hmm. And uh, it says, He who had vanquished death and the grave came forth from the tomb with the tread of a conqueror. Amid the reeling of the earth, the flashing of lightning, and the roaring of thunder, when he shall come to the earth again, he will shake not the earth only, but also heaven. So we're told this is going to be a glorious event. The last thing I want to take a look at on this part, the condition of the earth, um, and we should be getting a good picture now of what the earth would be like. Turn back to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 20 and 21. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. It says, But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. Okay. And it says, uh, I'm sorry, I'm in chapter 1, I'm sorry. Chapter 2. That's an interesting statement. Chapter 2, 20 says, In that day, what day? What day is it talking about here? Anytime you see in that day in the Bible, what is it talking about? The coming of Jesus Christ. That's it. It says, In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one to himself or for himself uh, to worship to the moles and to the bats. What are they doing with their silver and gold at this point? Throwing away. away. You know, Joe's telling me about there was a time in the Adventist church where they did campaigns and they would have uh, the flyers or the handbills or whatever, and they said people would be throwing their monies in the street and people would come out to hear it because why would people be throwing money in the street? But the Bible tells us that they're going to get rid of these idols. And can money be an idol for us? Oh, yes. Yes. It says they're going to be getting rid of it. Why? It says they're going to go to the clefts of the rock. Why is this statement significant? Hmm. Where else do we read about the cleft of the rock? Revelation 6. We read about it in Revelation 16. But Six. Think, Six. Six. And, and I, but we also think about, I think about Exodus chapter 33, I believe it is, when Moses asked the Lord what? He says, show me thy glory. If I found favor in your sight, show me your glory. And what did the Lord say? I will make all my goodness to pass before you. Only my face you shall not see, unless you die. And he put him where? In the cleft for the rock. So they should have been searching for the eternal rock, beloved. Yeah. But they spent their lives seeking silver and gold and the pleasures of this world. And now they've got to hide a rock that's going to be broken down. Yeah. 
That's significant. I didn't want us to miss that. And into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord. Why is he going to hide? For fear of the Lord. Is that the same fear that God's people have for him? No. What's different about this fear? They are running away from the Lord instead sure. of running to him. And it says, And the glory of his majesty, when he shall, when he ariseth, and I'm sorry, to shake the earth, or terribly shake the earth, or shake terribly the earth. So we're told that this company is right, running to hide from the Lord, but they shall not succeed in getting away. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 341 says, Then it will be seen that Satan's rebellion against God has resulted in ruin. Listen. It's just now that the sobering thought has crossed their mind that I've been living a life of fraudulence. I've been living a life of emptiness. With all my getting, I have nothing. I read a scripture once that says, you know, they, they, they money, their pockets like they had holes in them. I'm paraphrasing. So they, all they're getting was doing them no good. And it says at this point they realize that, it, oh, sorry, then it will be seen that Satan's rebellion against God has resulted in ruin to himself and to all that chose to become his subjects. He has represented the great good would uh, result from transgression, but it will be seen that the wages of sin is death. So it's only at this moment, finally, that the world wakes up and sees that I've been living in transgression of God's law. All the preaching in the world, all the the, the, they, they laugh at the people that come out the college campuses and go to the street corners and so forth and tell them to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. They scoff at the people that say, Jesus is coming soon. You need to get your house in order. But now it's self-evident. Now the handwriting, as it were, is upon the wall. You have been weighed in the balances and found how? Wanting, but too late. Mercy. So, there are some, we talk about some of the popular views of those, like a millennials, uh, uh, people that think that the millennium has always existed, and that we're living it now, that Christ reigns spiritually with his people now, so we're living it right now. And we talk about all these different views around the millennium. Some of us are of the opinion that they will have a chance to repent during this thousand years, but is that so? Does it fit in with Bible prophecy? So let's see what the Bible says. Uh, go back to Jeremiah with me. Chapter 25 this time. Where are we going? Jeremiah chapter 25. And this time we're going to look at verse... Let's look at verse 33. Jeremiah 25 and verse 33. It says there, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation." 33. It says, and the slain of the Lord shall be, I started up the book, I'm sorry. It says, and the slain of the Lord shall be at that time from how? From one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. Listen, it says, they shall not be lamented, neither what? Gathered, nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. So let me ask you this, if there's nobody to even pick up these corpses from the ground, how likely is it that they will have time to repent? And see, this is the deadly uh, doctrine of what's, uh, Im the immortality of the soul, mm -hmm. of teaching people that you will always be alive. You either live forever in heaven or you live forever in hell, but you never actually die. That's why this doctrine is so dangerous, because they're thinking that if I miss Jesus the first time, what? I can catch him on the second trip. But this is the only opportunity. So it says that they'll be laid out. They won't have any room for the Turn to chapter 4. Chapter 4. And verse 25. Same book. We're just looking at chapter 4. And we're going to look at verse 25. Alright. Verse 25 reads this way. It says, I beheld and lo, there was no man. And all the birds of heaven were flood. It's interesting, um, Stephen Board does a presentation on the millennium. And he talks about, and, and it's true, and he talks about, if you go back through Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter 2, and you look at what Jeremiah is representing in his book, 
and you look at Revelation 20, you see creation in reverse. You see it all the way in reverse. All the things take away. You remember the God added birds on a certain day and the livestock on a certain day and the vegetation and so forth. You see all these things being reversed. And then lastly, you see man slain, which God added on which day? The sixth day. So it's interesting to look at that parallel. Now, what happens to Satan during this thousand years? Our, our scripture reading should tell us that, but let's go back and review it. For my benefit and yours. Revelation chapter 20 Verse 1, 2, and 3. It tells us, it says, And I saw, what? An angel come down from where? Heaven. Having the key to the bottomless pit. We're going to go, we're going to take a look at that. But I'm going to read the rest first. And it says, and A great chain in his hand. What does he do with this key and this chain? It says, And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is who? The devil. And Satan, and bound him, how long? A thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and <coughs> set a seal upon him. That he should deceive the nations no more, till a thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed for a little season. So we're told that Satan is where? He's bound. He's imprisoned. A seal is set upon him. Now I want to go back to that term, bottomless pit. Now, it, it's just so, such, a, such helpful information, I can't pass the opportunity to share it. That comes from the Greek word, that bottomless pit word, comes from the word abusos. It's a Greek word. It was, it's where we get the word abyss from. Now, if you get the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, you find this word somewhere else. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Because we need to see something here. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. And of course we're very familiar with these verses. It says, in the beginning God created what? The heaven and the earth. And the earth was how? <laughs> and void. And darkness was upon what? The face of the deep. You know it's the same word that is used there for bottomless pit. So where is Satan really being held during this time? From the Bible. It's here on this earth. The earth just returned to the condition it was before God added form and before he added life and vegetation. So we can see that clearly from the scriptures. In fact, if you would be so kind as to turn over to Isaiah chapter 24, uh, verse uh, 21 and 22. Isaiah chapter 24. And we're going to look at the first couple verses there. It tells us something else about the condition of the world. Okay, verse 1 says this. Behold, the Lord make the earth how? Empty, and maketh it, a, maketh it waste, and turn it upside down, and scatter abroad the inhabitants that thus of. And then listen to verse 2. It says, and it shall be as with the people, so which the priest as with the servant, so with his master, and as with the maid, so with his mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, and so uh, and with the taker of usury. Oh, that word sounds familiar. <laughs> uh, with the usury, so with the giver to him. The land shall be utterly empty and utterly spoiled. For the Lord hath spoken this word. So, okay, so the world, we built that case. We had two, three witnesses that tell us the world will be empty at this point. What does what is Satan's chief attribute? What do we know Satan for? What, is, what does the Bible call him? What's the name for Satan in the Bible? Deceiver. Deceiver. Lucifer was his old name before he failed. He's no longer a light bearer. He's an error bearer. Uh, what about the accuser of the brethren? And you said a good word. Deceiver. Deceiver. So what do we know Satan for primarily? For deceiving people. Yeah. So what is Satan's job, as it were, if he wants to be a good devil? Mm -hmm. He's deceiving the nations, right? Mm -hmm. Where are the nations now? Here on earth. Well, at the time that we're looking at, at the beginning of the thousand years, where is the nation? Dead. They're dead. They're dead. All the groups. The earth is vacated. It's back, and Satan has said, what was his charges in Isaiah and Ezekiel? 
He says, I will be what? Like the Most High. I will exalt my throne into the northern part of heaven. You know, he's saying, I, 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 I. God says, okay, here you go. Here's a thousand years to do what I did in six days. And what do we come back and find Satan doing? <laughs> he hasn't created anything. He can't even give life to those who were his loyal subject. They're laying on one end of the earth to the other, slain by the coming of the Lord, by the, 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 the word of his lips. By the, the, the living testimony. Remember, he says, Think ye and do ye as those that will be judged by what? The law of liberty. <clears throat> and they've been judged. So we see that Satan cannot revive his subjects. Now, where are the redeemed during this thousand year period? Because we covered everything on the wicked side. Where are the redeemed? Turn to Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, and I'll throw in verse 6. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And let's see what we can gleam here. It says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were, what? Beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for what? The word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ. For a thousand years. So now we know this in companies who? Who is this group that's being mentioned here? Yes. And who else? Like the Walden Yes. So all the righteous from Adam down to the end of the ages, right? Yeah. And what job are they doing? But it, and it's interesting that you mentioned 144,000 because it, it says directly that they hadn't worshipped the beast or received this image or his mark or any of these characteristics. So we know that in a special sense, those that were martyred for Jesus for refus re uh, refusing to receive this mark and so forth, and those, the 144,000, as you mentioned, that should live until Christ should come, they are there in their company. But what is the work that is given to them during this time? What do you see there? They sat upon what? Thrones. Thrones. And what were they doing? Mm -hmm. Judgment was given to them. Yeah. Let's look at verse 6. It says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in which resurrection? First resurrection. The first resurrection. On such what the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with him a thousand years. During the thousand years, I'm reading from Great Controversy, between the first and second resurrection, the judgment of the wicked takes place. John in the Revelation says, I saw thrones and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. It is at this time that, as foretold by Paul, um, and I'm going to hold off on the rest of that. It said, but I'm going to read this part to you. It says, In union with Christ, they judge the wicked, comparing their acts with the statute book. Comparing it with the statute book. The Bible. And deciding every case according to the deeds done in the body. So what are the people of God doing in a thousand years? They're on vacation in a sense, but it's a what? It's a work vacation. So they got something to do during this thousand years. They're, they're ceasing from, from all the, 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 the meticulous work of this world. They have laid off the heavy weight of sin. They are with Christ. There's peace there. There's joy there. But they have a work to do. Because God has said that the wicked have violated his law and they have not become penitent. They are not able to enter the heavenly courts. And the, wicked, the righteous are reviewing the record books to see if this case is so. Okay, so turn with me to, to 1 Corinthians, chapter 6. 1 Corinthians, chapter 6. And let's look at verse 2 and verse 3, because Paul says something very interesting here, uh, which Sister White was hinting at, but I want to read the scripture to you. That's why I held off on that part. It says, Do ye not know that the saints shall judge what? The world. The world. And we're not talking about the physical proportions of the world, are we? We're talking about worldliness, worldlings, those that are carnal-minded, those that have put the things of the world, the pleasure of their flesh, above the things of God, right? It says, the saints shall judge the world. And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye not worthy to judge small matters? So the saints shall judge how much of the world? The whole world. Everyone that's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. 
Verse 3 gives us some more detail. Who else will be judged? It says, Know ye not that we shall judge who? Angels. angels. So let me ask you this. Is it the, the righteous angels that they're judging? No. Why not? Is it God they're judging? Is it the unfallen world? No. There's no reason to judge any of them, right? The fallen angels and who who's a part of that? Satan. He himself is being decided by the people he has tempted, that he has maligned, that he has persecuted, that he has put through trial and tribulation over and over again. He has to come before the judgment seat for them to review the record. It seems to me that that will take the shortest time to review because there's a lot of evidence against him. Is that right? Okay, so the righteous are in heaven. They are reviewing the record. So what happens to after the thousand years expire? What's the next thing on the, what, the event list? Well, let's not go in sequential order, but let's go to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, verse 2 and 3. And let's read what it says there. Then we'll also look at Great Controversies, page 661, 673, and 663. Revelation chapter 21 Verse 2 reads this way. It says, And I, John, saw what? The holy, holy city, city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So where's New Jerusalem coming from? It's coming out of heaven, right? Verse 3, it says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them. And be us and be their God. It's interesting we read in the Beatitudes that the meek shall inherit heaven, right? Inherit the earth. So where's the New Jerusalem coming down to? Earth. earth. Okay, we're gonna prove that from the scriptures. So let's go down to uh, let's go to Zechariah. And if you're using the remnant study Bible, this chapter page one thousand begins Zechariah. Let's go to Zechariah. And let's look at chapter fourteen. We're going to Zechariah chapter 14. And we're going to look primarily, we're going to look primarily at verses 5 and 10, but I want to back up to verse 1. And then we're also going to look at verse 4. So Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1, 4, 5, and 10. So, okay. So verse 1 says, Behold, the day of the Lord and thy spoil. What is spoil? Their plunder. Uh, some call it the booty. The recoveries from your, your war. It says, Shall be divided in the, in, uh, in the midst of thee. Jump down to verse 4. And it says, And he, his feet, shall do what? So we're going to actually get the location of where the new Jerusalem will be. It says, And his feet shall do what? Stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the mount, uh, sorry, in the midst thereof, toward the east and toward the west. What's happened to the Mount of Olives here? It's split. It's being what? Split and flattened. Because uh, it says it cleaves each direction. It says, and there shall be a what? Very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it towards the south. Let's jump down to verse 10 and 11. Same chapter. Verse 10 and verse 11. I'm sorry, 5 and then 11. Verse 5 says, And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains. And for, listen, listen to this. For the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel, even ye shall flee like as ye flee from before the earthquake. Interesting term. In the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. So, without a doubt, what event is being described? The Lord coming with all his saints, the second coming, right? And verse 10 says, And the land shall be turned as a what? Plain. So the Mount of Olives is now a plain from Giba, uh, Giba to Rimen, south of Jerusalem. And it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate unto the place of the first gate, unto the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananel, uh, unto the king's wine press. And this has come from a desire of ages. Oh, 
Yeah, this is coming from Desire of Ages. I'm going to share it. I'm going to hold off on it. I'm going to hold off on it because of time. So now, let's talk about it instead so I can kind of wrap up. So what happens is we see that New Jerusalem, after the thousand years, is restored to the earth, right? <laughs> When it comes to the earth, where, where does Jesus put it? Where the Mount of Olives is now, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we just read. So Jesus uh, lands New Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives. Now, we're going to be told some details about the wicked, because we read in Revelation chapter 20 what happens to the wicked just before Jesus comes. Okay, okay. So let's come back to chapter 20. And let's see what Satan does. In chapter 20. Look at verse 5. Revelation? Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5. Mm -hmm. Because it tells us at the end of this thousand years some more events has to, has to happen. It says, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. And this is the first resurrection. Of course, talking about the first set that were raised in Jesus' coming. So what happens at the end of this thousand years that we can get from verse 5? The rest of the dead or... Resurrected. The, live, the dead wicked are resurrected. Go down to verse 7. Verse 7 and 8. It says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So the dead wicked are resurrected. Satan is also <laughs> loosed. Why is Satan loosed? Ah, there are people to do what to? To tempt, to deceive. So Satan now has employment again. Yeah. His recession is over with, and he can go back to work for a short time. And verse 8 says, uh, And shall go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and where? Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sands of the sea. Now, we've heard a lot of talk about Gog and Magog. Some say it's Russia and China and so forth. But if you go back to the Old Testament, there's a much more feasible explanation as to who Gog and Magog are. They have always been the enemies of God's people. Remember, Revelation is what? A literal or symbolic book? How is it written? In symbolism, right? So why do we go back to the literal in this case? So Gog and Magog represents the enemies of God. So he goes and he gathers all these people to his great day, no, val no valley of Megiddo here. Uh, they're being gathered, gathered to take over or to apprehend the city of God. Uh, let's read uh, a couple statements from Great Controversy. So it says, Satan represents himself. Okay, so I'm having to jump around a little bit. It says, <coughs> Satan represents himself as to his deluded subjects as a redeemer. How does he represent himself? As a redeemer. Assuring them that his power has brought them forth. Listen to what he tells them. His power has brought them forth from the grave. Uh, he says, and that he is about to rescue them from the most cruel tyranny. He goes on to say, he uh, proposes to them uh, to lead them against the camp of the saints and to take possession of the city of God. With fiendish exultation, he points to the unnumbered millions who have been raised from the dead and declared that as their leader, he is well able to overthrow the city and regain his throne and his kingdom. So Satan has deceived the nations once again. I mean, is it really hard to believe because he's been deceiving them all along. They've looked to all the miracles. Satan placing disease upon people, then uplifting it as though he's healed someone. And they've looked at all these things, fire coming down from heaven, as it were. And they're saying, this must be our redeemer. Hmm. They have been deceived. And he deceives them to make war against the camp of God. Okay, but what happens to them before they can make war? Revelation 20, verse 9 and 10. Revelation 20, verse 9 and 10. It says, and they came up on the breadth of the earth and compass the camp of the saint. That means they surrounded the company or the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. What's this beloved city? New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem. Okay. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. What does it mean to devour? When you sit down to eat your food, you devour it. Do you keep eating indefinitely? Does the food stay on the plate, plate forever? Because that's what they're suggesting. 
Uh, verse uh, verse 10, it says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into where? The lake of fire. So what is the, so the devil's not in charge of hell, right? He's not going to be going around with a pitchfork, uh, poking people, telling them to turn over. You know, your sentence has just begun. Where does he go? He goes into the lake of fire. It says, And brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. What does that term forever and ever mean? I have a scripture here, but we can't go to them. What does that term mean forever and ever? Until the work is done. Remember, it talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. It says they will burn with everlasting fire. Is Sodom and Gomorrah still burning today? No, no it is not. So we have to conclude that forever and ever means what? Until the work is finished. It's an everlasting result, right? Okay, so let's move to our closing point. We read in Isaiah, and I'm just going to reference these because we need clothes. Um, Malachi 4.3 tells us that the wicked will be ashes on the sole of our feet. So it's without a doubt that they're actually burnt up. They are devoured by this fire, just as the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And we're told in Isaiah 50, 65, verse 17, that God is going to create a new earth. And he echoes the same statement in 2 Peter 3.13. And we can read Revelation 21, and verse 5. It says that, and he sat upon the throne, Revelation 21, and verse 5, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things how? Mm -hmm. New. And he said, Unto me, write, for these words are faithful and true. That means you can take it to the bank and cash it. Now, the last thing I want to say is how close are we to this actual coming? How close are we to this thousand-year period? Matthew 24, verse 33. And we're just going to look at these briefly because we've got we to gotta close. Matthew 24 and verse 33. It says there, it says, So likewise ye. When ye shall see all these things, know what? That the that it is how? Yes. Here, even at the door. So are we seeing the signs of prophecy being quickly fulfilled in quick succession, one behind another? Mm -hmm. And we're told also that the final movements will be how? Mm -hmm. Slow. Mm -hmm. They're going to take long successive periods of time, right? Mm -hmm. No, we're told that they will be fulfilled rapidly. So once this thing is in motion, everything's going to happen really fast. So Christ tells us we should know that we are close and at the door. Turn to Luke 21, verse 28. Luke 21 and verse 28. And it says there in Luke 21, verse 28, it says, And when these things begin to come to pass, then do what? Look up. Look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption is where? It draws nigh. Amen. And finally, Romans 9, 28. Romans 9 and verse 28 says in that verse, it says, for he, listen to this, don't miss this. He says, for he will finish the word. Amen. Mm -hmm. It says, and cut it how? Short. Short in righteousness. And beloved, it's interesting to me that we're living at a time where everything that God says is right, the world says is wrong. God says marriage is constituted between what? A man and a woman. God says that a, a, a boy that is born with male organs is a boy, and a girl born with female organs is a girl. And he says that if you are pregnant with a baby, then thou shalt not kill, but the world is saying the opposite, beloved. If the Lord doesn't cut it short in righteousness, there will be no life preserved. Imagine another generation coming up. What, what kind of vice will be prevalent in another generation of wickedness? Seventh-day Adventists beating the drum, running through, through, through the, all, the sanctuary, uh, 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 calling it praise and worship. This bedlam of noise. You've got young ladies saying that I'm leaving the church because Seventh-day Adventist church won't let me be a minister and taking long, large numbers out with them. Listen, beloved, we are in that time. Men are saying that the spirit of prophecy are just good commentaries. We are living in that time. If the Lord should hold off his coming, there will be no righteousness preserved. The Lord says, I will cut it short in righteousness. And stand to your feet and read with me. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 3. 1 Thessalonians 5, and verse 3. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 3 says this, For when they shall say, 
peace and safety. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them. As travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape, beloved. But we are not children of the night, are we? We're not of those that draw back. So the Lord has designed that we be children of God, look up with rejoicing. Shout and sing his praise. Blessed are they who waiting and watching look for the dunning rays. Are we looking for those dunning rays? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Dear Father God, thank you again, Lord, for the implanting of your word, Lord. We know that this word springs up into everlasting life. If we would take it and let it germinate the heart, Father. We're asking that the good seed, now that it's planted, would mature, Lord, and that it would bear in us fruit, Lord. For we know that every goodly vine bears fruit, Lord. We ask that you would now settle us in the faith, Lord, and as we prepare to depart from your sanctuary reverently, Lord, we just ask that you would help us to keep our mind on holy things, Lord. That now that we will get serious about Sabbath keeping and that we will get serious about bringing godliness into our practical lives, Father. Uh, we ask these things in the beautiful name of our dear Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All together we say, Amen.
Is that the, um, at the, 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 at the,